Nagara. But a lot of high flown things you have seen. But what they arrive, what they discuss and meet me and tell me is, so tell us something how we solve a problem of the patient picture and x-rays I have. So I said that you have the problems which are very severe and today we are in the world of damage control orthopedics that there is already a damage, don't add further damage. We all know that we are facing industrialization, urbanization, mechanized transport, urban violence, social conflicts and disasters. We are sitting on a bomb in this country. And look at these two vehicles and a person traveling in between in a village and he gets an injured. What treatment can you offer him? And we have the problems is not moving. So Millennium Trauma Care, we know we have advanced diagnostics, advanced visualization, arthroscope, minimal invasive techniques, computer assisted surgery, navigation and robotic surgery. We also know that we have various implants and every two years they are changing and every two years the cost is going up. However, we also know that with these high flown implants, two things we require. One is the cost constraint, which to my mind when I talk to an orthopedic surgeon is still a problem. And also, all this new technique to succeed, we need an operating environment. Good soft tissues, good facilities, good implants, good inventory, excellent training. Also, if we note, every three years there is information in the journal that new things which came up is not a panacea and you could have a problem even with them. Problem related to the implant or problem related to the basics of tissue healing and biology. And this gives an information that final word is not said. What are the important issues we have healthcare in India? They are not only technological concerns, but they are access to healthcare, availability of healthcare, affordability of healthcare, and accountability. We must understand that if you have injuries like this, which you see, your attempt should be to salvage that leg because no artificial leg can can replace a normal leg, I'll show you from example. So anything must offer benefits to all who need. We are only talking about inclusive growth. We are not talking about inclusive therapy to offer a good quality life. So we need to innovate. And what is innovate? Is to optimize the healing potential by use of an established principle in clinical care. We must develop and modify of device which are to be applied for clinical care to obtain desired goal and where conventional treatment is not likely to achieve sound healing and good function. You have here where an x fix is put on a bomb blast case where bones are gone and this will not give a final good result. We remember two names and I must say these are my teachers, late Dr. Katrak who was a pioneering orthopedic surgeon who believed that a good surgeon is one who knows where not to cut and if need, how much to cut. I think that's the message I'd like to give you. I also remember late Dr. A.K. Talwalkar, the father, one of the fathers of trauma surgery, who was an inventor. And what was his invention? It was a philosophy and concept. And what's that concept? Reduce the fracture, get the stability, Put the bones together, do not disturb the environment, let the body do the rest, art of surgery which propagated and promoted. His square nail today, in my opinion, which we feel is abundant, needs to be used and I still use it. We used to do open reduction and put this nail, had only 10% failure. Today with image intensifier friends, if you do a close, you will get almost 97% and you will not need a second big surgery because you can put them, they are put percutaneous. Here is an example of a fractured tibia, unstable, used by V-nail and stacked with another nail and notice how the bone is healing because the reduction is good. That a complex nail without interlocking 
proper reduction give excellent healing so art of healing you have to judge i see so many of them segmental fracture we do the most modern interlocking nail one fracture heals other does not heal and patient continue to have problem so what are our challenges we have complex trauma we have bone condition we have contamination we have poor primary care and we get late presentation what is the sequelae infection deformity and disability lifelong difficult to correct so also we must know that we have no primary care we have inadequate definitive care infrastructures needs to be strengthened we need instruments and implant but we must keep in mind the cost should be such that you can able to still tackle a very difficult problem and that's my job to show you today in clinical as to how by thinking and developing simple techniques without major surgery at a district and a good place with good uh, facilities you can do this surgery understand even in foreign countries infection rate is 0.7 to 9.5 percent so we have to know find out a solution to our problems with our understanding of our country we can't get solutions to our problems by reading the western literature as i'll show you from some of the cases keeping this mind i came to understand what is vital in life today we are so so pursued by the market forces and so much of philosophy is it the implant strength is it the implant design is it the metal or it's a reduction stability we are forgetting the art of reduction i think that must come back bone to bone contact and its maintenance permitting physiological collapse so elastic devices rigid devices won't work and restoration and maintenance of blood supply and if possible do retain the products of the fracture which have osteogenic potential so what is the innovation we must understand innovation is necessary if the injury is status in unsound conditions of the bone and soft tissues essentials of healing are bone alignment vascularity maintenance and third the technique should ensure maintenance of bone and soft tissue alignment to control axial rotatory angulatory and translatory forces use any technique and i propose to show you some of the techniques which you have used in difficult cases so if you put our mind into a research and find out we have various techniques non operative treatment intramedullary nailing plates x fix or adaptation combination and we have the need to have mechanical advantage biological advantage and functional advantage put them together and find out what is the tissue response in that bone and if you find each has a merit each has a demerit but if you have a surgery where you do minimal in, in, uh, uh, intervention you can still get a mechanical stability you can get prevent the axial and rotatory forces and permit function the response which is early in what happens in a, let me go back because this is an important slide how oh, this not coming pictures not coming okay in a healthy state the nutrient rt in end anastomosis supplies the bone in ultra state you have the injury and a fracture and you have intramedullary bone which is disturbed so that comes from the myofascial and osseous muscle in a complex trauma you have lack of understanding of the mechanism of injury difficult fracture pattern poor soft tissue status these are high velocity injuries and simultaneous multiple disability is the protocol and the need so how do you manage remove restore the soft tissue and bony alignment and stability after debridement and restoration of length by gradual distraction to increase vascularity and perfusion that's very important you should reduce the distal lymphovenous stasis because that will prevent infection repair the soft tissues and bony reconstruction and rehabilitation and restoration of function at the end of this so you get a realignment reduce it which will revascularize it 
and that should be modular that if you do it properly during the treatment you should be able to modulate and readjust the movement of the soft tissues and the bone so what is osteogenesis concept we all know about ilizaro and we also know about inclan and what do they say have the good perfusion give macro motion and you will get new histogenesis and i think that was a brilliant concept here is a case seven hours after birth tar injury in a 14 year old boy what has been done the inferior radioulnar joint has been reduced with one pin and what we did was just put a functional device a small wire fixator and positioning the hand and realigning to let the bone revascularize what happens next the plastic surgeon said that we must put a microvascular flap i said wait this is not the right time we waited what happened after waiting good revascularization you could see good healing and at the end see the function this is not 40 year old woman sustained a road accident with soft tissue injury fracture shaft femur and forearm at amputation of the middle finger i think the pictures are not coming what's happening oh god my pictures are not coming in this uh i wish they'd be come why are they not coming i checked it that day in the morning i had checked and i will check they're not coming i'm really sorry they're not coming you want to try this because i had gone in the morning oh yes it's here can you see now i'm sorry mr chairman nahi isko niche le aaiye niche niche le aaiye ऊपर 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 जाइए ऊपर जाइए ऊपर जाइए ऊपर जाइए और ऊपर एकदम ऊपर चले जाइए छोड़िए जाइए आगे थोड़ा थोड़ा नॉट कमिंग आई एम सॉरी अबाउट दिस i don't know why this happened despite i think the computer is of help but sometime it can put you in trouble i hope it doesn't happen to the aircraft it's coming here but it's not coming there it's coming now okay so chala hai all right so if you notice uh, she had a very bad fracture a crushed hand amputated base hand was gone so what we did we just stabilized the radius only basic stabilization of the radius and put a device and just position the limb we position the limb and then once the tissue is healed the hand collapsed and if the hand collapses you have to prepare a space in the hand so what we do do we put a device and open it out two metacarpals and after we open them out we put a intermetacarpal graft with a transfer spin so the result she got a claw hand and with that claw hand she could put an artificial hand and work now your device should be such that it must have the incorporation of the graft in core physical therapy devices and what we can do is alternatively move this elastic and move the fingers so that you don't get a tendon adhesion 
you don't get adhesion to the nerves. So at the end of it, you have mobile finger and you have got a good function. Here is an osteogenic fracture, a bus fracture. Just reduce in one single pin and neutralize it by a device so that axial forces don't act. Notice what happened. It healed and you could see the bone formation there. And this bone comes from those products and prolator quadratus. And that's a function in that lady. This is a high velocity trauma. Patient had a chest injury and a burst fracture tibia and also fracture of the shaft of the femur, of the tibia. So what was done? Intrafragmental reduction, neutralized by device and a wires which were pulled from below and got the reduction so that at next stage we can put a plate. Notice, because we create an environment, what happened? It started healing and at the end it completely healed, restoring the articular surface very well and even the tibia united. So understand, the process of healing, if you put it together and do not disturb can still heal. Advantage of this is, in case there is a delayed union, you can always do graft and in case you have to do plating, you have created a well aligned limb. This was a truck driver whose hand leg was crushed, a fractured talus and a very bad open injury, brought after 17 hours. Now we gave a debridement and on this we put in a screw because we had to stabilize the talus. Now notice, what did we do? We stabilized the fibula by a square nail because it was a transverse fracture, realigned the soft tissue and notice the comminuted bone here. The axis and limb align were restored. Naturally, we had to do a flap. And I was surprised when kept on dressing. At the end, we found that we put in a skin graft which healed. Now when this healed, I said, let me follow. So I gave him an orthotic brace and let him walk. Now beauty of this is, to address the tissues, you can just unlock and give the position to the limb, a position of function. So you can use the skin and you can play around during the treatment. What happened? You could get osteogenesis, the bone form, and this was the limb. Now notice, a very severe injury, patiently managed by innovative design, you could hit it. But understand, just don't put x fix and it will heal. It has to be put in a proper way. So here it was not put right, so there was a necrosis and death. But here it was readjusted and the toes were also supported, so that you started revascularization. Necrotic bone, which you think should come out with a small pin after debridement, you could get, now notice the tissues here, the tissue, oh, what have you done? Please don't change. Ajay, okay, no problem. So it started revascularizing. I want you to notice this and look at the skin here. Naturally, we put in a skin graft, supported the toes in an extended device, and notice now, at the end, in each of thigh. Okay. This was a diabetic. And in diabetics, you know, your open is a problem. So how do you do this? Trimalular fracture dislocation. So we got traction reduction and use simple pins to realign it. The problem here was how to get and prevent further collapse. So we put a device and put the foot in functional position. Notice it started healing and you could see the excellent healing there. This is five months afterwards and you could get a complete healing. We gave them a special footwear because they are peripheral neuritis. A road track accident in a policeman, Shakskar 6 fracture. We used a device to realign stage wise fixation, 
final assembly and notice he has multi-level fracture where later on we'll have to do something but we we'll just put the things together that's at the end of one week we started healing oh it's not coming it's not coming again all right and this is the final picture of that completely healed no secondary invention no plate no screws friends we are sitting on a bomb in this country anywhere you will get can you tell me do you have something for a bomb blast this is a conventional fixator can it hold to these injuries and how will you hold and if you put a elizar what will you do to do these surfacing can you save this time and he was a chartered accountant so after problem did badment this we could put a small wires <coughs> on every fragment you could see here given axial traction realign the length only the length of the limb and later on we created a situation to put the limb in functional position extended the device put traction on the limbs and made the finger straight and thumb away naturally we had to do a flap in this case but we created a good environment on a where microsurgeon could put a flap the collapse hand was later on reconstructed this is how the limb was saved he could hold he could type he could use a phone i i hope it works that's his function a completely gone limb which we have been able to salvage so what is innovation minimal invasive or minimal access surgery obtain stability through interfragmental alignment and contact maintain by minimal fixation enhance stability through soft tissue gradual distraction retain the products of the fracture which contain osteogenic potential the platelet breakdown product tgf alpha stimulate osteogenic mitogenic response and ensure function to assist remodeling so current understanding we have i am nailing we will have to have elastic or expandable nail we have mipo or lease sliding techniques and we have external fixator distraction osteogenesis but how many can be applied in small places so we have to design and this is what we designed in mumbai i agree that minimal trauma care my philosophy in minimal trauma care is if the technology is going to be of use we need to have such a technology which will give enough and adequate healing potential even to an average surgeon with average facilities in any place which i called inclusive orthopedic therapy i thank you for your attention thank you dr lord for your nice paper and finishing in time uh, well in time thank you very much the the next series of lectures has been designated as the dr p k duraswamy eponymous lecture and it is to be delivered by dr brex Dr. Briggs, are you here? Please. Can you do please give self introduction? Please. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for your kind invitation to give this lecture. the uh, eponymous lecture for uh, Dr. Thal Twaka. Uh, and as we heard from the previous speaker, he really was the father of trauma surgery in India. I understand that he qualified from the Grant uh, Medical College in Bombay, did his uh, residency under Dr. Palmer, and then came to the United Kingdom for, uh, for two stints. Initially he came and obtained his FRCS, and then came back and did some general surgery at the KM Hospital, where he met Dr. Katrak, a game we've heard, who was an orthopedic surgeon and suggested that he go back to the UK which he did where he learnt and studied in Liverpool doing the MCH orth and then went to the Mayo and then to Paris 
and really made a massive contribution in India to trauma surgery and also in the training of fellowships. So I'd like to talk to you, if I may, about isolated chondral defects of the knee and are the results that we have durable. I have no disclosures and my acknowledgements really are to my co-workers at Stanmore, Professor George Bentley, John Skinner and Richard Carrington. Now we all know that the structure of articular cartilage is unique. It has a superficial, middle and deep zone. It contains a huge amount of water and a special extracellular matrix type 2 and chondrocytes only account for 5 to 10 percent of the total mass. We know that while chondrocytes do not differ throughout the articular surface of the knee, the, uh, the amino glycosaminoglycans does differ and increases in the weight-bearing sites. And all that is to try and provide a surface that will distribute loads and provide a low friction articular surface for the knee joint. Now this is a guy called William Hunter. Many of you know the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons of England. And back in 1743, or 270 years ago, he recognised then that once you got an ulcerated cartilage within the knee, a damage to it, it was a very troublesome disease. And I think that continues to the present day and we're trying to improve the outcomes for our patients. Now clearly this remains a challenging goal for all of us and there is no doubt in my mind and what I'm seeing in practice in the UK that the instance of articular cartilage pathology is increasing. And to date I don't think there's any procedure that can totally and 100% reliably reproduce the biological composition and the mechanical properties of hardline cartilage. Now, what's the prevalence and instance? The problem is we don't really know. But there are a number of papers in the literature that will show that up to 63% of, of arthroscopies show articular cartilage lesions. And that was published by Curl, looking at 31,000 arthroscopic pr procedures. We do know, however, that the prevalence of chondral deflex in the athlete's knee is greater than the general population, and patellofemoral defects are more common. Again, a problem for us as knee surgeons is we don't know or understand always the natural history. And again, that varies from paper to paper. But we do know that if you've got an asymptomatic lesion, there is no evidence in the literature that you must go ahead and treat that. And there is not a lot of evidence to show that these asymptomatic lesions, especially if they're partial thickness, will become symptomatic in the future. The ones I'd like to talk about today are the ones that are causing problems either with instability, pain, locking, swelling, and they may have had an in, a, a concomitant injury at the same time. We carry out a diagnostic arthroscopy, and then we can define our management. There are certainly simple arthroscopic techniques, such as debridement, and some reports that just show that that can be quite significantly um, beneficial to patients. The one that we always talk about is marrow stimulation, whether it be abrasion chondroplasty or indeed microfracture. And the idea is to produce a primitive mesenchymal stem cell clot, and we know it will produce a type 1 collagen repair, which in the long term we know is less mechanically stable. A lot of work was done in the 80s uh, and published uh, about abrasion chondroplasty, especially in the early osteoarthritic population, and they talked about a 75% two-year improvement. But I think you had to be very cautious about extrapolating that to patients with a discrete osteochondral injury. Also, several studies have shown no real difference. Then we had drilling, which was popularized by uh, an English guy called Preedy in the late 50s. And then Richard Stedman took that to a, a new level where he didn't use a drill because of the heat. He used his little pick. And then he produced these little holes that go through the subchondral plate uh, and um, again, three to four millimeters apart. And the idea again is to produce a fiber cartilage repair. And on the right, you can see it was very important to let down the tourniquet at the end of the procedure to make sure that you've got this bleeding and therefore you get this super, this super clot forming. So what's the evidence? Well, the evidence shows that in most studies, you get a 60 to 80% improvement in patients, especially those with smaller defects, less than 40 years of age, the femoral condyle appears to be de better, and also slimmer patients. And also, if your duration of symptoms is also shorter between the onset of symptoms and the surgical treatment. But the problem, and I think we all realize that this is going to be a factor, 
is if you're producing fibre cartilage, you would expect with time for the results to decline. And that was reported by Hunsker in 2002. And we know that durability of fibre cartilage repair does remain a concern. And then you come on to, well, if that doesn't work, what have you got? You've got some cartilage replacement techniques, and we can talk about osteochondral autographs. You can then talk about the massive osteochondral allografts. And mosaic plasty and oats procedures were popular and have been um, published in the literature. But these are for small to medium-sized defects and really takes a small plug of bone and cartilage from a healthy part of the knee, puts it into an unhealthy part. And the person who wrote more about this in the literature has been Hangudi, and he talked about excellent results on the femoral side at three to five years. And that's probably the largest series in the literature. But what I'd like to talk to you today about, really, is the other way, is using cells and tissue engineering, and chondrocytes in particular, and talking about ACI and Macy, if I may. We also all know that the isolation of freezing chondrocytes goes back to 1965, Audrey Smith uh, published this in Nature. And then my colleague, uh, George Bentley, was one of the first to successfully culture cell allograft chondrocytes with no bony component and in the Petri dish. But it was really this um, gentleman, Lars Peterson and Mats Britberg, who published this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1994. And they were the first group to report successful treatment of isolated chondral defects in the knee. And they used periosteum to cover the cells, and that was really the first generation. The second generation then came along, instead of using cells, but using a chondroguide membrane, and then they further characterized this, or subdivided this, into the Macy technique, where the cells were already seeded onto the membrane. The membrane is a type 1, type 3 porcine membrane. It's 5 by 4 centimeters. It's, it provides an inert seal, has very low immunogenicity, and has been shown in maxillofacial surgery to resorb in about three to four months. So the method is to isolate and um, look at your defect, take some cells from the trochlear on the medial side, send them to the lab, and we will often grow 50,000 cells to about 20 million cells when they return. And then you choose your technique that you're going to use when the, the cells return to you for use in the patient. With ACI, this is quite a fiddly process, requires a large incision, interrupted um, 6-0 vital sutures around the membrane to make sure the defect is watertight. It is then covered with tissel glue, and then you do a water test before you insert your cells. With Macy, the cells already on the membrane allows you to operate through a small incision, and then you make sure the cells are applied to the subchondral plate and are kept in place by tissel glue. The great thing about Macy is it's technically simpler for the surgeon. There is no doubt there is a reduced operating time, and you can get to much more difficult sites, especially the back of the femoral condyle. And there is, in our experience, we've been able to treat larger defects and more multiple defects. And if you're doing a combined procedure, a combined ACL or PCL reconstruction or tibial osteotomy, the Macy procedure allows you to do that very much more easily in the time frame that you want to use it. So I'd really like to talk to you about my personal series, which is 332 patients with an up to nine year follow-up of 101 ACIs and 231 Macy's. And I think what's important is the response rate from patients is extremely high because patients have been very interested to see how indeed they get on. Clearly, the medial femoral condyle is the commonest site of the lesions that I've seen. But as we've got used to the procedure, the patella has become more common. The mean size of the defect is 3.5 square centimetres, and the mean age of surgery is 31 years. And the timelines and the age range for our original study was patients with defects, isolated chondral defects, from 15 to 55 years of age. There is no doubt that the Macy um, um, defect size is slightly bigger than the ACI. <clears throat> what was interesting when we started was all these patients were really at the end of the line, Many of them had multiple previous procedures. And if you weigh up the economic cost and the cost of the patient, this was quite significant. We know from the work we've done that we can get a good infill of the surface over 12 months. Can we, what we planned to do in the, the first study was all patients would come in, have a biopsy at one year, and a repeat arthroscopy. I think if we were going to repeat the study again, 
would actually delay that until two years. We can use MRI scan now, which shows very nicely how the ACI or Macy is doing and can demonstrate on sagittal views and coronal views or how good the integration can be on the border. So if you look at the modified Cincinnati rating score of ACI versus uh, and, and Macy, comparing their pre-op to their post-ops, post we can see there is a significant increase in improvement in, in outcomes on the ACI side out to nine years and on the Macy out to five years. And what we find when you look at it at the bar chart is actually the Macy um, is slower to get off the ground than the AC, but then after the first year outperforms the AC at subsequent years. If you look at the Lism and Gilka score, it is exactly the same. ACI seems to get going more quickly, Macy lags behind, but then Macy does overtake ACI. Again, if you look at the patient functional outcome scores, we found a similar outcome. We've also looked at the histology of patients using stains, H&E and safranin O, immunohistochemistry using immunolocalization and S100 and collagen types 2 and 10, and also in situ hybridization, looking at types 2A and types 2B, looking for a messenger RNA in the first 13 samples. And the biopsies were taken, they were full thickness, they were done with a Jamshidi needle to make sure we got host bone and also the regenerate. Safrin O can demonstrate the proteoglycans and the, the pattern you see, where you want to see more proteoglycans in the deep layers. If you look at insensual hybridization, this is a methodology to look at whether you've got messenger RNA for types 2A and types 2B collagen. And what we demonstrated was that in all groups in the first 13, whether the histologist thought there was a fibrocartilage repair, a hyaline, or indeed a fibrous, that we had collagen type 2A messenger RNA in the deep zones. And we also found that with type 2B. So irrespective of what our histopathologist told us, we were seeing the messenger RNA for types 2A and types 2B collagen. And of those 13 samples, all showed messenger RNA for those. There was little seen on the surface, it was all in the deep area. Immunohistochemistry is you use S100, which is a very good cytoplasmic marker for chondrocytes. But you can also use immunolocalization, which uses a Klaus van der Werck uh, antibody to look at types 2 and type 10 collagen to see if you've got it. And what we found is, again, we see a type 2 collagen in the deeper layers, not in the superficial layers, and also type 10 in the very deep layers, but not in the superficial layers. So the histology of the first 13 samples using these various techniques showed that in all cases, deep layers showed messenger RNA for collagen types 2A and 2B. The deep layers showed collagen type 2 protein is present in all the biopsies, and type 10 was present in all the biopsies too. So we concluded from that that we're seeing a fibrous upper layer and maybe a hyaline type in the deep layer. Now of my total group, we have 248 biopsies to share with you, with the mean timing of the biopsy at about 14.8 months. And if you look at what our pathologist has said, looking, breaking them down into hyaline light, mixed hyaline and fibro, fibro and fibrous tissue, just over 51% show demonstrable evidence of hyaline-like repair. And if you look at how the biopsies change with time, and Macy is the, the, slot, is the uh, line on the right, and ACI is on the left, I think this now confirms why Macy is slow to get going, in that the regenerate you see with Macy is slow to become a mature hyaline-like type from a fibrocartilage repair. And I think that if we went and did our biopsies and our study at two years, I think our outcomes on histology would be different. And there's no doubt I tell patients that things continue to improve for up to 24 months. What we were able to do and demonstrate, however, from this group uh, of over 200 patients was that we were then able to see whether there was a difference in outcome score and whether there was a difference between the two. There's no doubt they both improved, as already demonstrated, but the ones that had a hyaline uh, tissue in the regenerate, again, uh, had a sig more significant difference in post-op scores between those groups, which does suggest that if we can produce a hyaline tissue in the regenerate, they will have an improved functional outcome. And you would hope with time, they will be a more durable type repair. We've also done this surgical technique in adolescents, 
between the ages of 13 to 18 with a mean age of 16, and we have 37 patients, of which 26 were ACI and 11 were Macy. Again, the mean of femoral condyles, the commonest, patella second, and the, if you look here, the mean size of the defect compared to adults is much greater, 5.11 squares. Etiology, trauma, osteochondritis dissecans, and chondromalation. If you ask the patient in terms of visual analog score, how they're doing, there's certainly a significant improvement in both ACI and Macy. And if you look at the modified Cincinnati rating scores, again, both significant improvements from their pre-op scores, and again, a durable outcome to past 70 months. We've looked at the histology on this group. We've got 21 biopsies, and 52% show a hardline-like or a mixed hardline type repair. So what are the factors that influence outcome for patients? Certainly in our study, we used an age group of 15 to 50. There's no doubt that patients who've got two or less procedures on the, the defect before, um, are, do better. And if their symptoms have been of less than two years duration. You don't clearly want to operate on osteoarthritis. You want as normal a BMI as you can. Non-smokers do better than people who smoke. And what you want is patients who have not reached the point where they've got malalignment of their tibiofemoral or patellofemoral joints. So the evidence out there in the literature is that you can get good to excellent results in 70 to 90%, depending on the, de the defect location and the clinical series. And in our results, there's no doubt that Macy produces a very similar outcome to AC. Does age influence outcome? Well, we've got it. There's a paper that was published in the American, jo uh, American uh, Journal of Sports Medicine in 2010 we looked at patients um, who were young uh, as a, to an old group of 47.8 compared to an age group of 31, and they showed that even if you're over 40, those patients will not have an inferior outcome 24 months after ACI. How does it compare to mosaic plaster? Well, my, my colleague George Bentley published this in the British Journal in 2003 of 100 patients randomized, and there's ACI did a clinically better at one year, and the uh, graft incorporation and appearance was very much better compared to mosaic plasty. They published the 10-year results in the journal of 2012, and again, the outcome shown a durable result for the ACI as a, were compared to mosaic plasty. We also know about the paper that was published by Nutz et al. on 80 patients uh, in over eight centers um, in Norway, and they showed 77% of satisfactory results at five years using both methods, and they said at that time there was no correlation between histological findings and clinical outcomes. But we know if you use a fibrocartilaginous repair, the evidence shows that it's up to five years before you start to get your failure of your, your reparative tissue. So we need to see what the results are going to be at 10 years and onwards, I think. And we know that Saris published in 2008 that the results at one year post-treatment with the chondrocytes, he showed that there was, this was associated with a superior tissue regenerate, the microfracture. And that's, I hope, what we will see. So does it work? I think absolutely right. And certainly it's become a real um, uh, other alternative method of treatment for many of the patients that we see at home. We think there's about 10,000 patients a year that are affected, but it is still not, not yet fully funded through the NHS, but I hope now with the evidence we've accrued over the last 10 years, that will happen. Are the benefits sustained? Absolutely. And can it produce a highline like cartilage? Yes, it can, but clearly not in all cases. So what's the evidence? Are people using it? Absolutely right. If I would showed this evidence about five or six years ago, then I would suggest many, many surgeons would have continued with microfracture. But certainly in Europe now, over a third of patients now with defects two centimetres, two square centimetres or bigger are, being, are, are using ACI and it really has grown in popularity and outcomes for patients. What about the economic analysis? And that's a real big thing that's happening in the UK at the moment when you're talking about hip and knee replacements, expensive up front, but actually over a 10-year cycle, very worthwhile and works out about £10 a week. There's no doubt that if you compare microfracture to ACI and Macy, the expense of ACI in Macy at the, at the front end is expensive. But if you look at durability over 10 years going forwards, then it becomes a very, very 
cost-effective procedure. So in conclusion and treatment recommendations, we do not treat asymptomatic chondral defects. If you have abnormality and malalignment, you must correct that. If you've got a lesion of between one and two centimeters, we would use microfracture, but more than that, we would use AC and MACI. And bone deficiency is not a contraindication, and we will bone graft any defect that's more than five to eight, cent eight millimeters in depth. ACI is still the gold standard, using either, I think, a um, periosteum or using an inert membrane like a scaffold, like, such as the Condra Guide. But we think MACI, MACI is now the equivalent, and that's what we tend to use <coughs> and offer our patients. But I think what the cartilage and what the histology do demonstrate is that we've still got a, an articular cartilage injury is a multifactorial process, and we know there are more than one types of treatment, and we need to know a little bit more, I think, about the host where you're putting those cells. Because we know the cells are the same that we're putting into patients because we check them before they go in, and that host environment clearly has a role on what the cells will produce. So we need to address these, the mechanical and biological factors, and then we need to look at other therapy approaches. Because if you're using ACI or MACI, that is a two surgical procedure. One is an arthroscopy and the second is an open procedure. The thing is, can we use other cells such as stem cells using a polytherapy approach along with growth factors that can actually give us a one-stop, uh, off-the-shelf, self-based device that means one operation for patients and bring down that cost and increase efficacy. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you very much. Hence, there is a very important announcement. Mr. Shiv Khera will deliver the presidential guest lecture at 3 p.m. in this hall. Mr. Shiv Khera who is a well-known orator, will deliver the presidential lecture at 3 p.m. in this hall. Right. There's a, there's a slight change in the schedule, which was announced earlier. Since we have some time, we are squeezing in a paper by Dr. Ajit Sagal and he will be speaking on non-spinal causes of backache. Dr. Ajit Sagal from Varanasi. Good day everybody, respected chairman. It is said that bread and butter of orthopedics is now trauma and joint replacement, but still bread is low backache. But once we talk low backache, we all always think of any orthopedic problem. But this, my presentation is to brush your memory to tell you that many times we are wrong and this backache may be because of the other problem which we have to search and exclude. This is the picture you can imagine once the patient of backache is there. The low backache is an, in an industrial city. It's a good sale media for many industries. Advertising industries, manufacturing industries of adjustable bed, mattresses, special back care chairs, herbal ointment, medicinal spray, heating pads, magnets, analgesics, muscle relaxation therapy and back care clinics. The overview back pain can be the presenting symptom of systemic disease, metabolic disease, rheumatic disease, visceral disease, vascular and neurological causes. X-ray sometimes gives a false positive result. Only CT, MRI are the choice of investigation. The medical causes may be high fever, severe cough, thyroid problem, parathyroid problem, hypertension, diabetes, geriatrics, and osteoporotic. Coming to the psychological causes, unhappy wives, no issue, over busy executives, school-going children during examination, 
industries with frequent transfers and incompatible bosses. It is an industrial disease. This is the safest way of malingering. No standard gas for pain measurement. Regular absentees are there. Work compensation claims are due to LBA. Family leave and higher turnover rates. General productivity losses because of the low back. Incidence. Incidence of low back pain is approximately 80% once or twice in the whole life. In USA, this is the second leading cause of the hospital visit and the third most common cause for the surgery. Coming to the recurrence of low back pain, within one year, it can be seen in 20, 20 to 44% of the patients. Within 10 years, 80%. And as a permanent disability, it remains in 5%. And after the surgery, 7 to 20% may be suffering with low back pain. Coming to the economic consideration, low back pain is most common expensive cause. The maximum workers' compensation claim in USA is because of low back pain. There is loss of 149 million workdays annually in USA, and the cost of those work time is approximately $28 billion. Coming to the vascular causes, the aortic aneurysm. This is commonly seen after 50 years of age. Palpable pulsatile mass in the abdomen, common in male. And patient can come with low back pain. Coming to the gynecological causes, endometriosis is most common. The presence of endometrial gland and stroma outside the uterus, they are hormonically active. Female of a reproductive age, prevalence is 8 to 10 percent, and they present with pelvic and back pain. Diagnosis by ultrasonography and laparoscopic. The pelvic inflammatory disease, it may be infection and inflammation of the female genitals. Young age female, multiple sexual partners, most time ascending infection is there, intrauterine devices may cause low back pain, douching can cause low back pain, and patients they present with back pain, pelvic pain, dysuria, urgency, and leucorrhea. Ectopic pregnancy, the pregnancy with implantation outside the uterus, they can present with low back pain, endometriosis, previous pelvic and in abdominal surgeries are may be the common cause, and they are the risk factor. Sign and symptoms are the missed period, morning sickness, breast tenderness, vaginal spotting, back pain, unilateral pelvic pain may be there, additional marks are there. Diagnosis is positive pregnancy test and ultrasonography. Other causes may be uterine malposition. Coming to the genitourinary causes, prostatitis, it may be infectious or non-infectious. Acute or chronic bacterial prostodynia. Men over 30 years with UTI. Febrile illness with back pain with urinary symptoms. Diagnosis is clinical. There may be tender, boggy prostate gland. And in cases of the CA prostate, PSA is diagnostic. They can also present with back pain. The genitourinary causes, nephrolithiosis. 3% in USA, the oxalate crystals, uric acid, calcium phosphate, stones are there. Sign and symptoms are flying pain and back pain with fever, chills, nausea and vomiting. Microscopic hematuria can be seen with low back pain. Other causes can be pyelonephritis. In this case, you can see the size of the kidney is smaller than the normal size. The gastrointestinal causes, pancreatitis is more common in male, aged more than 40 years as a chronic disease. The etiology is alcohol abuse, cholelithiasis, hereditary. Some drugs like dextropropoxifen, they can cause pancreatitis. Infections like mumps and other violent infection can cause pancreatitis. The signs and symptoms are abdominal pain, radiating to back, nausea, vomiting and fever. Diagnosis is by raised serum amylase, ultrasonography, and is to be confirmed by CT. Other causes can be the penetrating or perforated gastric or duodenal ulcer. Sign and symptoms are abdominal pain, radiating to back, resembles acute pancreatitis. The diagnosis is by X-ray. There is air under the diaphragm and by endoscopy. Come to the gallbladder causes, gallstones may cause low back pain. 
Here you can see the pancreatitis, gallstones, and the gastric ulcer. They, the patient can present with low back pain. Coming to the other visceral causes, the retroperitoneal causes like retroperitoneal hemorrhage, any tumor and pyelonephritis may cause low back pain. And the colonic problem, colitis, diverticulitis, and the neoplasm, they can cause the low back pain. Other causes, menstrual pain can cause the low back pain. Neoplastic infiltration of any nerve in the pelvis, they can cause low back pain. Coming to the rheumatological causes, fibromyalgia is very common. It is a chronic musculoskeletal pain disorder. Fever, fatigue, stiffness, swelling and paresthesia, these they are the other symptoms. Prevalence is 2%, but this is more in females. And 4%, they are associated with the psychological disorders. Pyromyalgia rheumatica, in older patient of the proximal hip and shoulder girdle pain, this is also more in female, etiology is unknown, and it dramatically responds with low dose of cortisone. Women are affected more than men, and sign and symptoms are shoulder, neck, upper back, and lower back pain, thigh pain, and stiffness. Other seronegative spondyloarthropathies, they can cause the back pain, like spond ankylosing spondylitis, Ritter's syndrome, psoriatic spondyloarthropathy, intropathic arthropathy. Age is usually less than 40 years at the onset. Dull, deep acute back pain is there in the gluteal or parasacral area with morning stiffness. Other cause can be the Forrester disease in which we get ossification of the spinal ligament common in male and sign and symptoms are back stiffness and back pain. The piriformis syndrome is another cause of low back pain. Buttock and leg pain resulting from inflammation or compression of sciatic nerve under the piriformis muscle, they can cause low back pain. The trochanteric bursitis or the gluteal bursitis, etiology is unknown but patient can present with low back pain. This is the, you can see the trochanteric bursitis and the piriformis syndrome presenting with low back pain. Other metabolic diseases like osteoporosis, Generalized loss of bone mass with reluctant <coughs> risk of factors, common sites are vertebrae, distal radius and hip. Females have much higher risk with increasing age, menopause, steroid therapy, excessive alcohol consumption, inactivity and smoking. Diagnosis is by plain radiograph and DEXA scan. They can present with low back pain. Here you can see the normal one. You can compare with the osteoporosis and the patient can present with low back pain. The osteomalacia. The disorder of the bone metabolism characterized by defective malnutrition of organic matrix, osteoid. Etiology is vitamin D deficiency. Inadequate calcium phosphorus at mineralization front. Abdomen, abdomen, uh, abnormal matrix. Drugs like phenotoin and barbiturate, they can cause osteomalacia, and patient can present with low back pain, skeletal pain, and the waddling gait characteristic. You can see the picture with loser's zone in the osteomalacia. Coming to the another cause, Paget disease. This is a focal disorder of the excessive bone resorption associated with disorganized bone formation of unknown etiology. Signs and symptoms are bone pain, and they can present with the low back pain. Diagnosis is by X-ray and raised alkaline phosphatase. Here you can see the normal and the patient with Paget disease, and they can present with low back pain. The diabetic poly polyradiculopathy, they can also present with uh, low back pain. Low back pain. The age of onset is typically over 50 years of male with mm -hmm mild and recent onset of diabetes due to neural ischemia or infarction, they can have the low back pain. The another cause may be the epidural abscess, which occurs in 10% of the spine infection. And about half of the patient with epidural abscess are misdiagnosed on their initial evaluation. Patient initially complained of local spinal pain, followed by radicular pain, weakness, and finally paralysis. The most other common cause is the malignancy 
and 75 percent are over 50 years of age. There is a previous history of malignancy in 30 percent and less than, less than 1 percent of all persons present with back pain. Uh, Two-third metastatic lesion from the breast, lung, prostate, kidney are more common. Myeloma is the most common primary spinal malignancy and non-spinal malignant back pain due to intrapelvic tumors, retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, renal cell cancer, and pancreatic cancer. They can also present with low back pain. PSA is diag diagnostic in cases of the CA prostate. Lumbar radiograph is sensitive in 65%. CT and MRI, they are highly sensitive. Bone scan is highly sensitive, but may be normal in myeloma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seigel. Friends, this is the end of this session, and you will agree that it has been a very educative session, and we are grateful to all the speakers who have shared their experience with the audience and will be going wiser after listening to them. Thank you very much. Thank you.